In this video, we're going to look at how we can represent a straight line in 2D Cartesian space using an equation. Now, being able to represent different geometric forms as equations is incredibly useful for solving problems with mathematics. As we'll discover throughout the rest of this DVD, problems such as finding the intersection point of two lines or the intersection between a line and a circle, which would be a lot more challenging to solve using purely the geometry involved, actually become quite easy to solve when we're dealing with the equations that represent that geometry. And it's hard to stress just how useful being able to represent lines and other geometric forms as equations is to us when we're working in computer graphics and programming. So I thought perhaps the best way to stress this would be to illustrate how useful I found these simple concepts to be for tackling some fairly large and complex problems. And to illustrate that, I'm going to describe two projects that I personally have worked on in recent years, which have made extensive use of equations to represent lines, circles, and other geometric forms. The first project was an artificial intelligence system that included collision avoidance, and that was for a combat space simulator. So we have this area of 3D space, a number of spaceships flying through it, and they're trying to attack each other, they're trying to follow each other or avoid other ships, and they're trying to avoid obstacles in that scene. And I had to approach the task of generating an artificial intelligence system to control these ships. So without going into too much detail on how I achieved that, my approach was to take this scene and to turn it into a simple sphere-based representation in 3D. So each of the ships got a bounding sphere, each of the obstacles got a bounding sphere, so we're just dealing with spheres moving in 3D space. And taking that 3D scene and all of those spheres, for each ship, I constructed a 2D image of the scene as the ship sees it. So if we imagine that a ship had eyes into the scene, we constructed a 2D image, a photograph, if you will, of the scene as that ship sees it at that current point in time. Now, of course, if there's a number of spheres in 3D, if we take a 2D picture of that 3D scene, what we're really going to see are a number of circles. So this 2D image basically consisted of a number of circles in 2D space, each represented as equations. Now, I also represented the trajectories of various ships, the trajectories of obstacles if they're moving and the likes, as lines and other mathematical forms in this 2D space. And by analyzing all this information, analyzing all the equations that exist in this 2D image, this 2D space, and by using theories that are covered in this and subsequent DVDs, I managed to drive the behavior of each ship. I could determine how I wanted that ship to steer, whether to accelerate or decelerate, all by using simple equations, intersecting lines with circles, and comparing positions of circles to the origin of that 2D space. So that's one example. Another example is a ray tracer. It's a renderer where we have all of our objects in a 3D scene, and we fire some rays from the camera, intersecting those rays with the objects. And when a ray intersects an object, we maybe evaluate a shader on the object at that point. We maybe reflect some rays off of that object and cast more rays into the scene. And for that renderer, the most important element, if you will, is knowing whether a ray has intersected an object or not. So in my ray tracer, all of the objects internally were represented as equations. And the rays that we fire into the scene, that we reflect in the scene, were also represented as equations. Now, using fairly simple theories, they're theories that are basically developments from the line circle intersection and other intersection theories that we're going to discuss in this DVD. They're kind of an extension of that concept into 3D and dealing with more complicated forms, but they are in concept very similar to those, I used those theories to determine whether a ray had intersected the object or not, and also find the precise point along that ray in which the intersection had occurred. And that allowed me to determine, do I need to evaluate the shader? Is this the object that we've hit first before any other objects? And allow me to then make the decisions based on that. So there's Two examples there of how using equations to represent geometric forms can actually be very useful to us for solving a rather large variety of problems. And that's just two examples from the work that I've uh, researched recently. I mean, there are countless examples of why using equations can be useful to us. So now that we know why equations are useful, 
why don't we jump back to the purpose of this video, which is to discuss representing straight lines in 2D Cartesian space. So how do we represent a straight line as an equation in 2D Cartesian space? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to think about what exactly is a straight line. And a straight line is nothing more than a linear relationship between our x and our y axes. But what do I mean by this? Well, let me draw a line in our 2D space and discuss that idea further. So I'm just going to draw a line, some arbitrary line, and then I'm going to jump back to a layer that will let me draw. Fantastic. And grab a brush. So here's our straight line. And I just said a second ago that a straight line is nothing more than a linear relationship between x and y. Well, what I mean by this is that if we were to take any point on the line, so let's take this guy right here, and we're to travel to some other point on the line. To get to that point, we have to travel some distance in x and then some distance in y. Now, any point on the line, if I was to travel the same distance in x, to reach the line again, I would have to travel the exact same distance as we did earlier in y. That is to say that for any distance that we travel in x anywhere on our line, we're going to have a proportional distance that we have to travel in y. And it can be helpful to think of this as if I was to travel one unit in x, how far would I have to travel in y? And that value is constant along the entire line. Because the line is straight, it has a linear relationship, a proportional relationship between how far we're traveling in x and how far we're traveling in y. So what is the simplest linear relationship between the x and the y axes? Well, personally, I think there's an equation that is pretty much the simplest linear equation there is y is equal to x. It relates the x and the y axes and it relates them directly. It says any value that we have in x, it's going to take that value and use it in y. But what does this really mean in terms of drawing a line? Well, I'm going to clear myself some space. I'm going to get rid of the line that we just drew. There we go. So what does this really mean? Well, we know if we're plotting a point in 2D space that we have a set of coordinates. We have an x coordinate and we have a y coordinate. What this equation is saying is that given any x coordinate, we can put that x coordinate into the equation. We can use the equation to generate a y coordinate and then we can take that y coordinate and put it paired up with our x coordinate. So that means that on this line, any x coordinate that we generate will generate, using an equation, a corresponding y coordinate, which gives us a point that exists on the line. Now, when you're familiar with how these equations map to lines in our 2D space, it's quite easy to go from looking at an equation to simply drawing the line. However, when you're first starting out, maybe you can't determine just by looking at the equation what line you'd get from that equation. So how are we going to plot that line in our Cartesian space if we don't know what it should look like? Well, it's really quite simple. What if we just choose some values for x and using those and using our equation generate some values for y? We then have a set of coordinates, a set of points in space and if we were to connect all those points using a straight line, that straight line would be the graphical representation of our equation. So I'm going to generate some coordinates here, and then we can plot them in our 2D space. So I think that four coordinates should be plenty. Now, for those of you who are familiar with straight lines, we only actually need two points to derive and define a straight line in 2D space. You only need two points. But just to show a few more examples of generating points using the equation, I'm actually going to generate four sets of coordinates. So let's start out and let's pick some x 
coordinate values, and then we can use our equation to generate the y coordinate values. Of course, it's going to be very simple, but it's worth seeing this in progress. So I'm going to pick, I don't know, x equals 2 for my first coordinate value, and then x equals 6 maybe for my second. I'd like to get the origin or something around the origin in there. So I'm going to choose x equals 0. This will become apparent later. And, I don't know, let's choose a negative value of x as well. So why not x equals negative 5? So we have these values of x. We have a value of x is equal to 2. We have a value of x is equal to 6. We have a value of x is equal to 0, also known as our y-axis. And we have a value of x is equal to negative 5. Now somewhere along these lines, if you will, that we're dotting that say, okay, all of these points have an x coordinate of 2, well somewhere along there is going to be a point that has a y coordinate that will satisfy this equation. So we have this equation of y is equal to x. So if we take our x coordinate at x equals 2 and we put that into the equation, well, that means that if x is 2, y is equal to 2. And if y is equal to 2, that's the value that we put in as our y coordinate. So y is equal to 2. Okay, so that means we have a point 2, 2. So 2, 2 in y. And this is the point that we're going to plot. Fantastic. Let's move on with our second point. So x is equal to 6, so we put 6 into our equation. That means that y is equal to 6. Okay, nothing else we need to do to work out the value of y. We've got the value of y there. That goes in as our y coordinate. So we have the point 6, 6. Fantastic. So let's follow along 6 in y. There's 6 in x. So that's our other point. So coming down, we have x equals 0, so we put... Zero, 0 in as our value of x in the equation. That means that y is equal to 0, which goes into our coordinates. So y is equal to 0. So we have a point that goes through the origin. Fantastic. And one last point, we have negative 5 as our x. That means that y is equal to negative 5, which means that that goes into our y coordinate for this final point. So we have minus 5 in x, let's try and draw this a bit more straight, minus 5 in y, giving us a point down here. So we have four points, we have 2, 2, we have 6, 6, we have the origin, 0, 0, and we have negative 5, negative 5. If we were to connect these points with a straight line, we will have a line that is the graphical representation of the equation y equals x. Now, of course... I've drawn this by hand, so the chances of everything matching up perfectly are pretty slim, but we'll see what we can get working. That's not bad, actually. So there is our line. Let me jump back to a whiteboard I can draw on. And I can label this line y is equal to x, because this line graphically represents that equation. Now, of course, because our values along the x-axis go on infinitely, and in the negative x-axis go on infinitely. This line does actually extend infinitely in both directions, but we don't really need to worry about that. But we do have this line, y is equal to x. But what does this mean in terms of this line? Well, it means, we can see, if we were to move one unit in x, we move up one unit in y. If we were to move two units in x, we move up two units in y because there is this direct relationship between x and y. And we can check, as I erase some of our scribblings around here, we can check that this is indeed the correct relationship between uh, the graphical representation of our line and our equation by putting some more points into our equation and checking that those points do indeed match on the line. Or we could put some points on the line and check that they satisfy the equation. So if I was to choose another value in x, let's say x 
equals 4 and I find where on our line does x equal 4? Well, right here is where x equals 4 and what value in y is that? Oh, it's a value of 4, so that point is 4. 4, and if we put the x value into our equation, well, y is equal to 4. Yes, y is equal to 4, so this is the equation of this line. And this line is the graphical representation of this equation. They are one and the same because the great thing about Cartesian space, and this is, again, as I mentioned in the Cartesian coordinates video, this is the true power of Cartesian space, is that it enables us to graphically represent equations that use variables that we have mapped to different axes. So here where we have an x and a y variable, we can map those to the x and y axes and graphically represent that equation. So that's a look at this straight line. This straight line has some interesting properties. It goes through the origin. We saw that because if x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0. And as we mentioned, if we move along one unit in x, we move up one unit in y. And that means as long as our scales in x and y are the same, but this angle between the x-axis and our line is 45 degrees. So that's our line y equals x, but how do we get other lines? Well, there are really only two properties of a line that we can manipulate. We can manipulate this angle from the x-axis, and we can manipulate the position of the line in Cartesian space. Let's start out with the angle, and in order to explore this, I'm going to need to make a little bit more room on the whiteboard, so I'm going to... Yeah, this guy, fantastic. I'm going to delete out this layer. I'm going to create a new layer. And I'm just going to relabel this line really quickly as y is equal to x. So we need to manipulate this angle between the x-axis and our line. And how are we going to do that? Well, we saw the reason that this angle currently is 45 degrees is because of the relationship between how far we travel in x and how far we travel in y. If we travel one unit in x, we're traveling on the line y equals x up one unit in y. And that's the same anywhere on the line. So if we travel one unit in x, we're traveling up one unit in y. It's this relationship, this relationship of for every single unit we move in x, we move up one unit in y that is defining that angle. So if I wanted to change the angle of the line, if I wanted a line that was steeper, for example, I would need to change that relationship. I'd need to change it such that for moving one unit in x, we move some other distance in y. So if I wanted a steeper line, it's going to pass through the origin, but I want a steeper line. We can see that if I travel one unit in x, I need to travel more than one unit in y in order to have a line that's going to be steeper than our line y is equal to x. So let's say, for example, that when I travel one unit in x, I want to travel two units in y. So I've traveled along one unit in x, I've traveled up two units in y, and that's given me this point here, the point at 1, 2. So let's make note of this point, it's going to be useful later. I'm then going to travel along another unit in x, so that's going to be 2, because obviously 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. And I need to travel up two units in y, so 2 plus 2 is 4, so my y coordinate is 4, giving me another point. Let's do this one last time. So I'm going to move along one unit in x, so that gives me x is equal to 3, and up two more units in y, that gives me y is equal to 6. And we did note early on that this does indeed pass through the origin. So there we have a set of four points and those four points are going to define another line. And we know that that line, because for moving one unit in x, we're moving two units in y, we know that that line is steeper than our original line, y is equal to x. So let's just draw that line in so we can see indeed it is steeper. So we know it starts at the origin. It's going to go through these points. It does, of course, continue 
down here. So try and eyeball this angle in something like that, approximately. And this is our line y is equal to something. But what is it equal to? Well, it's this relationship between how far we travel in x and how far we travel in y that is going to determine the equation of this line. So hopefully by analyzing these four points that exist on the line, we can see a very simple relationship between the y coordinate and the x coordinate. Remember, of course, our equation needs to be such that we put the x coordinate into our equation, perhaps we add to it, perhaps we multiply it, and that is going to generate our y coordinate. So we need to look for a pattern here where putting our x coordinate in to some equation generates our y coordinate. Well, let's look at these. 0 becomes 0. OK, maybe that doesn't help us. 1 becomes 2. OK. 2 becomes 4. And 3 becomes 6. In each of these examples, we're taking our x coordinate and we're doubling it. We're multiplying it by 2 to get that y coordinate. So in other words, what we're really saying is y is equal to 2 times x. y is equal to 2 times x. And as we mentioned in the earlier video on rearranging equations, this can be written as y is equal to 2x. It means the exact same thing, it's just a shorthand, and you're going to find that this shorthand is so commonly used that in actual fact, almost every single equation you ever see is written in this form. You would never see someone write 2 times x like that. Very, very rarely would you see that. So y is equal to 2x. Well, hey, not only have we just defined the relationship between these points, we have just defined the equation as I erase that question mark, we have just defined the equation that represents this line. And if you don't believe me, well, let's check it out. I mean, again, this is freehand drawn. It might not be fairly accurate. But let's choose some other point on the line. Let's choose the point x is equal to 4. So if I work up x is equal to 4, where does that touch the line? Let's find out. Travel along horizontally. Oh, hey, it hits the line at y is equal to 8. So when x is equal to 4, we need a y that's equal to 8. If we put a value of 4 into our equation, x is equal to 4, 2 times 4 is 8, and indeed our y coordinate is 8. We can try that one more time. I'm going to try with a value of, I don't know, let's try 5. I'm not sure how well this is going to work. Here's a value of 5 if we move along horizontally. Not quite because my scales are a little bit off and my lines are a little bit off, but it nearly reaches the y is equal to 10. So 5 in as our x value. 2 times 5 is 10. And indeed, roughly speaking, again, it's because this is all hand-drawn. It's not perfectly accurate. But if it was computer-generated, this would be a y value of 10. So we've seen because we move one unit in x and up two units in y, we multiply our x by 2. But on our other line, because we moved one unit in x and up one unit in y, we only multiplied by 1. This relationship, this number that we're multiplying x by, is called the gradient of the line. And it's commonly represented by the letter m. So commonly, it's represented as y is equal to mx. m is the gradient of the line and it is a parameter of our line that is a constant value across the entirety of a single line and it defines how steep the line is. It defines the angle, if you will. It isn't an angle, angular value, but it does define the angle. It defines the gradient of the line, the steepness of the slope of the line, if you will. And by changing this gradient value, we can increase or decrease the angle between the line and our x-axis. So with a positive gradient, if we increase our gradient, the angle here is going to increase. We've seen this already, that as we increase our gradient from 1 
to 2, the angle has increased. Well, we could increase this further. What if we had the gradient m is equal to 4? That would give us the equation y is equal to 4 x. We can plot a few points and see that indeed that does give us a steeper gradient than either of our two lines. So if x is equal to 0, y is equal to 4 times 0, which is 0. So we're passing through the origin again. If x is equal to 1, y is equal to 4 times 1, which is equal to 4. So the point 1, 4 exists on our line. And I'm going to plot one other point. If x is equal to 2, y is equal to 4 times 2, which is 8. So y is equal to 8. If I then join these up with a line, there we go, and grab the layer that I can draw on. This line is the equation y is equal to 4x. And we can see, indeed, the angle is greater than with a gradient of 4 than with a gradient of 2, which is in itself greater than when there was a gradient of 1. So we can see increasing a gradient when we have a positive gradient is going to increase the angle between our line and the horizontal or x axis. Likewise, decreasing the gradient is going to decrease the angle. So instead of having an m of 4, what if I had an m of a half? Our gradient is a half. That means y is equal to half of x. Well, we can plot some points and see that line, and we'll see that the gradient is less than with our y equals x, y equals 2x, or y equals 4x, as we'd expect, because half is less than 1, 2, and 4. So let's plot some points. We know, again, if x is equal to 0, y is equal to half of 0, which is 0. So again, we're passing through the origin there. If x is equal to 2, say, y is equal to a half of 2, which is equal to 1. And if x is equal to 4, y is equal to a half of 4, which is 2. We can join these up with a line. Fantastic. Let me just grab my layer I can draw on. Fantastic. This is the line y is equal to a half x. And we can see, indeed, the angle between the x-axis and that line is less than the angle between any of our other lines. So again, by increasing our gradient, we're going to increase the angle. By decreasing our gradient, we're going to decrease the angle. And we can even use negative numbers for m. So rather than just having a positive value for m, we can use negative numbers. And that means instead of our line rotating up from the x-axis, up like so, our line's actually going to rotate down from the x-axis, giving us a line that travels somewhere in this direction. Then we can see this. I'm going to choose a gradient of, I don't know, let's choose a gradient of minus 1. So y is equal to mx. That means y is equal to minus 1 times x, which we can simplify down and rewrite as y is equal to minus x. So again, let's choose some values. If x is equal to 0, well then y is equal to minus 0, which is just 0. So again, we're passing through the origin. If x is equal to, let's say, 2, y is equal to minus 2, so minus 2. If x is equal to 5, y is equal to minus 5, so somewhere along here. Fantastic. And let's try putting a negative value in for x. So if x is equal to negative 5, or well y is equal to negative negative 5, which is positive 5. So that's right up here somewhere. We can connect these with a line. And we'll see, as I do that, something like so, trying to make it pass through the origin, perhaps I'll be better off going this way. I think my final point I plotted was a little inaccurate. Something like this. And this line that we just plotted is the line of y is equal to minus x. So already we can define a huge amount of lines by manipulating that gradient, that m value. But we're not quite done yet. This allows us to rotate our line all the way around, but we're still restricted to lines that are passing through the origin. What if we want to translate 
our line in Cartesian space. Well, this was the second property, the position of our line in Cartesian space. And it's also very easy to manipulate, just like our gradient. So let's clear our diagram a little bit, just back to something a little simpler than we've got right now, and then we can explore, well, just how do we translate our line in Cartesian space? So I'm going to bring up my layers, and I'm going to get rid of everything except for uh, y is equal to x line, and I'm going to get rid of all of our notes, and I don't think I'm going to need to get them back, so let's delete them. I'm going to bring up a new layer. Fantastic, and let's label this as y is equal to x. So if I want to translate this line vertically, what I need to do is for a given x coordinate, I need to manipulate the y coordinate that we're getting out when we put that x coordinate in. And because we're translating vertically, I'm either going to be adding something to that y coordinate or subtracting something away from it. So let's say, for example, that I wish to move this line up by one unit. Well, currently, if I put, say, 5, since I circled that a second ago, as our x into the equation, we work out that y is equal to 5, and that gives us the point right around here of 5, 5. But if I wanted to translate, there we go, if I wanted to translate this point up by a unit, when I put 5 into our equation, I need to get 6 out of the equation so that our y coordinate, instead of being 5, is 6, and I've translated it up by a unit. Likewise, if I was to put 2 into our equation for x, instead of getting 2 back out for y, I'd need to get 3 so that we have translated the line up by one unit. So in each case, instead of taking our x value and using that as our y value, what we're doing is taking our x value and adding 1 to it to translate our line up 1 in y. And we can see how this equation will translate us up 1 in y because we're saying we take our x value and we're adding 1 to it to generate our y value. Thus, our y value is always going to be 1 more than it was with the equation y equals x. If y is 1 more than it was with y equals x, we're going to be 1 unit up higher in y. And if we were to draw this line, we would see that it looks just like this. And I'm going to cheat by duplicating our existing line. And then I'm going to move this guy up right around here. And then grab my layer again to draw. You're going to see that the line y equals x plus 1 looks something like this. It is exactly the same angle. You can see the gradient on both of these lines are the same. They are parallel to each other, but we have translated the line by adding something to that x value. And we can actually translate further than 1 if we wanted by adding more to this y coordinate result. So we could say y is equal to x plus, let's say, 3. And instead of translating up by 1, in this case, we would take our x, for example, 2. We'd put that into this equation. We'd say, OK, well, x is equal to 2, but I want to then add 3 to that, 1, 2, 3, which is going to result in our y being 5. Again, where we had x is equal to 5, if I was to put that in, we're going to say, well, instead of y being 5, which it was with y equals x, I'm going to add 3 to that. 1, 2, 3. 5 plus 3 is 8. And again, if we were to plot this line, so if I duplicate this and move this line, it's going to look something like that. So again, our line is parallel. It's got the exact same gradient because in all of these cases, our m is equal to 1. So in all of these cases, y is equal to 1 times x plus some value. So that m gradient is always equal to 1. Hence, our lines are all the same gradient. But how much we're adding on to that value is translating as up in y. If we wish to translate down in y, we simply subtract something 
from our y equals x equation. So for example, if I had y is equal to x minus 1, that means we're translating minus 1 in y or down 1 in y. Again, taking our points 2 and 5 as an example. If I put 2 into this equation, we say, well, here's x is equal to 2, y is equal to 2, but we're saying y is actually equal to 2 minus 1, so y is equal to 1. Again, 5 into here, 5 minus 1 is 4, so 5, 4. We can see we have indeed translated down by a unit. And again, just to prove one last time, we have the same line with the same gradient, the only difference here is, again, its position. So the more generic form of writing this would be something like this. We saw we had y equals mx, but now we're taking that y equals mx and we're adding a translation in y to it. y is equal to mx plus ty. Now, just as a quick aside, those of you who are familiar with the line equation, you may be wondering why I'm using the notation ty rather than the more commonly known notation. We'll get to that later. Right now, I'm simply concerning myself with a translation in y, and I want to represent that as ty. And this is actually a little confusing because you might think t times y. No, this is a single value, I'm going to use subscript y just so that we're certain. This is a single constant value. For example, here ty is equal to 1, here ty is equal to 3, that we're adding on after we've evaluated m times x to generate y. And we can demonstrate this again with a, a line other than y is equal to x. So I'm going to get rid of all of our lines, in fact. And I'm going to do some crazy erasing to get rid of all our scribbles. Let's get rid of these and get rid of all of these. Bear with me one second. Fantastic. So where we before we had y equals mx, we're now having y equals mx plus ty. So let's choose another line. We saw the line y is equal to 2x, and I can very quickly plot this if x is equal to 1, y is equal to 2, if x is equal to 2, y is equal to 4, if x is equal to 4, y is equal to 8, and if I was to join all of these guys up, we get something like this, and if I was to use that line and then carry it on like so, and then bear with me, Merge those two guys together into one. Fantastic. So this is our line. And that line is y is equal to 2x. So m is equal to 2. But if we were to add something to that line, we can translate this line up and down just as before. So let's say I wanted to translate this line down by two units. Well, that means ty needs to be minus 2. So in theory, our line should be y is equal to 2x minus 2. Let's plot some points here. Let's make sure that that is indeed correct. We should have a line that is the exact same gradient as this guy, only translated down two units. So if I put in x is equal to 0, 2 times 0 is 0, minus 2 is negative 2. So we have a point down here. If I put in x is equal to 1, 2 times 1 is 2, minus 2 is 0, so we have a point here. If I was to put in x is equal to 2, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 2 is 2. And finally, if I was to put in x is 4, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 2 is 6. If I was to join all of those up with a line, again, I'm going to cheat by duplicating this guy. I want to move him. There we go. So if I was to move this guy, roughly speaking, something like that, you can see that indeed we have translated down two units. So it's the exact same gradient, but we've just translated in y by two units. So this is how we translate in y. We take our y is equal to mx, 
And what we're doing is we're adding or subtracting some value to that to either push all of our y-coordinates up or bring all of our y-coordinates down, and that's moving us in y. But how do we translate in x? How do we translate horizontally? Well, if when we're translating in y, we're taking our resultant y-coordinates and then adding or subtracting something from them to move them up and down, we are effectively manipulating our y-coordinates, if you will, to translate in y. What we need to do to translate in x is to somehow manipulate our x-coordinates. But we have a little bit of a problem there. If I was to scroll down, if we have y equals mx plus ty, we know that when we have our coordinate xy, what was the process we were doing? We were taking this x-coordinate, we were putting that into the equation, evaluating the equation to generate a y-coordinate that we then plot with that x-coordinate. And that's fine. That allowed us to evaluate our equation and then add or subtract something to that final value in order to translate up or down. But if we're manipulating our x-coordinate, we need to manipulate it before we use it in that equation because we're not calculating an x-coordinate based on y. What we're doing is we are using that x-coordinate to generate our y. So that means we need to effectively isolate this guy, isolate this x-coordinate and manipulate it before we use it in any other part of our equation. So if I have y equals m x plus ty, I've not changed anything, but I've used parentheses to isolate our x coordinate, I can now make any changes inside these parentheses, and because we know our order of operations, our parentheses are going to be evaluated first, because of that, any changes we make to our x coordinate within these parentheses are going to be applied before we multiply that by m and then before we add ty to the result. And what I want to do, much like adding ty, I want to incorporate some translation in x. So y is equal to m x. I'm going to say minus t subscript x plus t subscript y. Now why am I subtracting tx? Well, to understand this, we need to understand the effect that adding or subtracting a value from our x-coordinate has when we plug it into this equation. So I'm going to scroll down and let's see the best way of explaining this. So let's say we have a coordinate x, y. How are we generating our y-coordinate? Recall, we're taking our x-coordinate, we're plugging that into our equation right here, we're manipulating that value, using that value to generate a y value, and pushing that into our y coordinate. So, if we take that into account, unlike adding ty, where adding ty actually affected the y coordinate, subtracting tx, it's not affecting our x coordinate, it is instead affecting our y coordinate. Why is this? Because we're taking our x, we're plugging it into the equation, and we're using this value of x, which doesn't change, we're using that value of x to generate some value of y. So even if we subtract tx from our x coordinate, we're not actually manipulating this guy. What we're doing is we're manipulating our y coordinate. So with that in mind, it kind of works in reverse. If we were to scroll back up to our equation and, yeah, let me get rid of this guy and this guy and again do some erasing to get rid of all of this. And let's get rid of all of this as well. So let's go back to our really simple example where we had uh, y is equal to x, in which case we know that m is equal to 1 and our ty is equal to 0. So y is equal to x, and we can plot that. So bear with me as I get this guy plotted really quickly, something like this. Draw a line. 
something like that really quick fantastic so this is our line y is equal to x well let's say i wanted to translate this and i'm going to say four units just so that we have some real space in between if i wanted to translate this four units to the right well i can duplicate this line and i can translate this guy four units to the right And what we can see, if I bring back up, there we go, my whiteboard, I have translated this line four units to the right, or four units in positive x. But now, look at how we're evaluating this. We're still taking some value in x, plugging that into some new equation, and generating, using that equation, a value in y. So let's take a look. I'm going to basically rewrite this equation out up top. So y is equal to m x minus t x plus t y. Fantastic. So let's take a look at what happens if we were to say, well, I want to translate four units. So that means my t x is equal to 4, right? Well, let's see. Does that mean that tx is equal to 4? Well, in this case, our equation is telling us to subtract 4 from x, but that doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, if we're subtracting from x, aren't we going to be translating to the left? No, we're not, because of the way that we're taking an x-coordinate and plugging it into the equation. So let's see exactly what's happening here. We're taking our x-coordinate, and if tx is equal to 4, we're going to subtract 4 from that x-coordinate, so subtracting 4, we become 0. We're then going to use 0 in our untranslated line to evaluate our line. Think about this. We take our x-coordinate, we subtract 4 from it, and that becomes these parentheses, which these parentheses become the x in our original line, y equals mx plus ty, our non-translated line in x, these parentheses are that x value. So we're taking 4, in this case, we're subtracting 4 from it to get 0. We're then using 0 in this original equation to evaluate some value of y. We can see here when y equals x, if x is equal to 0, y is equal to 0. But then notice, we said that y is equal to 0, but what was our x coordinate that we put in? Our x coordinate was 4. So when x equals 4, we subtract 4 from it, which gives us 0. We put that into our equation, which gives us our value in y right here of 0. And then we're moving that back over to where x is equal to 4. So what we're really saying, because of the fact that, and it all comes down to the fact that we don't actually change this x-coordinate. We put the x-coordinate into the equation to generate a y-coordinate, what we're saying is the equivalent of translating our line four units in positive x is to sample our untranslated line four units behind in x. So if we are an x equals four, we want to sample our original line four units to the left, but put that back at our current position and that is the equivalent of translating our line. So let's look at another example. Let's look here where x is equal to 9. So what we're saying is, well, if x is equal to 9, I want to subtract 4 from that. Gives me a value of 5. And that now becomes the x in our original equation. So I put the value of 5 into our equation. y is equal to 5. We can see that here. We're effectively sampling that untranslated line and then we're putting that back because we said x is equal to 9. What's our value of y when it's 9? When we said, well, our value of y, we sample back on the original line. That's equal to 5. We put that back. So our value of y is 5. And we can see, yes, indeed, here we have an x of 9 and a y of 5. So this is why a positive translation in x is a positive value for tx but that we subtract that from x. And it's all, again, all relating to the fact that we don't manipulate the x-coordinate itself. We put the x-coordinate in, 
and we use that to generate a Y. So because we can't just say, well, let's just add two or add four to our X coordinate, we need to think slightly more complicated in as much as what we're really doing is we're sampling a point further back than we really are in order to offset that over to our current position. So that might seem a little bit confusing, but it really is actually quite simple. And actually, you don't even really need to worry about horizontal translations when you're writing line equations. So you're going to think to yourself, well, OK, you've just shown me all of this stuff with TX here and minus TX. And now you're telling me it doesn't really matter. Well, why is that? Well, we can take this equation, y is equal to m, x minus tx plus ty, and we can expand it. So y is equal to, well, m times x is x, m times minus tx is minus m tx plus ty plus ty, which we can rewrite as y is equal to mx plus ty minus m t x. Notice, what if we were to take this and group it, and then we were to say that this is our new t y, because this is in the exact same form as y is equal to m x plus t y. This is just a constant value, and t y minus m t x is a constant value, t y, m, and t x are all constant for a single line. So we could say that really a translation in the horizontal direction, a translation in X, can be thought of as a translation in Y. And we can see that with our line here. We've translated our line in X, but we could have equally translated it in Y and got the exact same line. And because of this, you don't really ever hear of translating in X and translating in Y with a line equation what you hear is the line equation written like so. y is equal to mx plus c, plus some constant value that indicates the translation of the line. And commonly, this value uh, called c is actually known as the intercept. And the intercept is called such because c, the intercept, is the value at which we cut the y-axis. Now, this might sound a little bit confusing and crazy, but I'm going to clear some of our whiteboard space and explain both visually and then mathematically why this is the case. So I'm going to clear away our lines, so I don't need those. And in actual fact, I can rewrite any equations, so I'm going to delete this entire layer. It just save me erasing this manually. So let's say that we had two lines. We have the line y is equal to x, and we have the line y is equal to x plus 4. Now, we saw our equation, y is equal to mx plus c. So, m in both of these cases is 1. We just have 1x. c in this case is 0. So, just to make that really obvious, let's add 0. c in this case is 4. Well, we know the equation y equals x is very easy to plot, so I'm going to very quickly plot this guy. We seem to be drawing this line an awful lot. And let's create him. Fantastic. And then we know that I should hopefully, if I duplicate this guy, there we go, be able to translate him up. If I was to translate this line up for units, we can see that, and just to prove that here, where x equals 2, y equals 2, y now equals 6. So I have indeed translated this up for units. We can see that here, where the intercept was 0, our line y equals x plus 0 cuts our y-axis at y is equal to 0. And here, our line y is equal to x plus 4 cuts our y-axis at y is equal to 4. So that's it visually, but there's actually a very simple mathematical reason as to why this is the case. Think about it. When our line cuts our y-axis, our x value must be 0. The y-axis sits right here through the origin of the x-axis such that 
when x is equal to 0, we are some point on our y-axis. So we know that x is equal to 0, therefore y is equal to mx plus c. x is equal to 0, so y is equal to m0 plus c. 0 times anything is 0, so y is equal to 0 plus c. And we know that 0 in this case has no effect, so just y is equal to c. Therefore, when we cut the y-axis, x is equal to 0, and that means our y-coordinate at the point where we cut the y-axis is equal to c. It is equal to our intercept value. And that's really all there is to our line equation. So I'm going to scroll down, write it out again. y is equal to mx plus c. And we saw there are two properties that we can manipulate to define any straight line. Our gradient and our intercept, which defines a translation in y, which defines the point at which the line cuts the y-axis, and which in turn defines any translation, because even a translation in x can be represented as a translation in y. And knowing this, when you now come to see some line equation, I'm actually going to just draw this really quickly down here to save me scrolling up and down. If we saw some line equation, I don't know, y is equal to 4x minus 2, we can quickly see, okay, well this is my gradient, m is equal to 4, this is my intercept, c is equal to minus 2. It's very easy to draw this line because we know, well, if c is equal to minus 2, we cut the y-axis at minus 2. And then if our gradient is equal to 4, that means if I move along one unit in x, I move up four units in y. We have two points. <laughs> that was shocking. But if we were to draw these two, join these two points together, this would form a line that would have that equation. So now that you understand the gradient m and the intercept c, as long as you can work out these two values from looking at the equation, which is very simple as long as it is a line equation in that form, then it's very quick to be able to plot that line to understand graphically what that line means because we have now analysed in some depth what the gradient means in terms of effect on the line and what the intercept means in terms of effect on the line. It's also, if we have a line drawn in space, very easy to determine the gradient and the intercept. We can find the intercept because we can see where do we cut our y-axis. And we can find the gradient by asking, well, if we move one unit in x, how far have we moved in y? That is our gradient. We put those two values into our equation, y equals mx plus c. So we put our intercept in here, our gradient in here, and that is given as the equation of our line. And that really is all there is to the straight line equation. Okay, so to test our newfound knowledge, I'm going to get you to draw some simple equations as lines. So I'd like you to try and draw these lines using your knowledge of the gradient and the intercept to basically get the line without having to plot too many points. But if you do struggle, then just simply put values into the equation, choose values for x, Put it into the equation, evaluate that into a y value so you generate a set of coordinates. Once you have those coordinates, plot them all, join them with a line, and that would give you the line that is the graphical representation of that equation. Now, in order to do this, I think what I'm going to do is clear away everything except for our graph. There are our axes, fantastic. I'm going to bring up a new layer. I'm going to do each question on a new layer. I'm going to write the question, and then when I come to answer it, I'll draw it on the graph. So question one, I'd like you to draw the line y is equal to 2x plus 3. So go ahead and pause, and when you come back, I'm going to draw this line and explain how I got to that answer. Okay, welcome back everyone. So we saw earlier we have y is equal to mx 
plus C. That means in this case, our gradient M is 2. And our intercept C is 3. So if our intercept is 3, that's where we cut the y-axis. So we're cutting the y-axis right here. If our gradient is 2, that means if I travel 1 unit in X, I'm traveling up 2 units in Y, giving me another point here of 1, 5. If I connect those two points together with a straight line, and then, apologies, there we go, continue that line something like so. This is our line, y is equal to 2x plus 3. Just to kind of check that, let's grab, I don't know, this value here. So x is equal to 2. 2 times 2, if we put 2 into here, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. And if we were to follow this along roughly, we can see that y is 7. So that is indeed the answer for question 1. And that was how we plotted the line. So that's question one. Let's erase this guy. I'm going to leave the line drawn just so we can compare all of our lines at the end. But there's question one. So question two is going to be to draw another line. In this case, draw the line y is equal to 4x minus 1. So go ahead and pause. Give this a go. Try and draw this yourself. Once you have an answer, or if you get stuck, unpause. And I'm going to work through it here on the whiteboard. Okay, welcome back everyone. So again, nice and simple. We've got our gradient, it's equal to 4, and we've got our intercept equal to a negative 1. So we know that we're cutting the y-axis here at negative 1. And we know if I move 1 unit in x, I'm moving up 4 units in y. So 1, 2, 3, 4, giving me a point right here at 1 in x, 3 in y. And if I was to connect these points, that gives me a line like so. If I now name this, that's y is equal to 4x minus 1, and that's all there really is to it. We could perform a check, I guess. Um, we could take a point here, x is equal to minus 1. If x is minus 1, 4x is minus 4, minus another 1 is minus 5. Indeed, y is minus 5. So this is the line of y is equal to 4x minus 1. Fantastic. So now let's take a look at another equation. So in this case, y is equal to, I don't know, a quarter x plus one. So go ahead and pause, give this a go, and when we come back, I'll work through it on the whiteboard. All right, welcome back, everyone. So hopefully by now you're getting really comfortable with this. It's the exact same procedure, very quick, very simple. So our intercept is 1. That means we're going to cut the y-axis here at y equals 1. And our gradient is a quarter. So if I was to move one unit in x, I'm going to move a quarter unit in Y. Now, to help me draw this a little more accurately, because I am just dealing on this whiteboard, I don't have graph paper or anything with any real measurements on, what I'm going to do is I know if I move one unit in X, I move a quarter unit in Y. Therefore, if I move four units in X, I'm going to move one unit in Y. So I'm actually going to move out four units in X, up one unit in Y to plot my next point and then draw a line that connects those two points. Like so. And this is the line y is equal to a quarter x plus 1. We can see our gradient is much shallower than the other two lines, which makes sense because here the gradient was 4, here the gradient was 2, and here on this line it's only a quarter, so it's a much much shallower gradient. And let's test this out. Let's test out, I don't know, x is equal to 6. So if x is equal to 6, a quarter of x is 6 over 4, which is equal to 3 over 2, or 1.5. And then we add 1 to 1.5 gives us 2.5. If I was to follow this along, obviously I don't really have the accuracy here, but you can see kind of we are at 2.5 so indeed that is working nicely so there's just two more questions I want to work through the next question is question four 
And question four is y is equal to, I don't know, let's say minus 4x in this case, and plus 3. So go ahead and pause the video, give this a go, and when you unpause, I will work through the answer. All right, welcome back, everyone. So this is the first question that we've got that has a negative gradient in, but let's start out just as we've done before with our intercept. So the intercept is positive 3 right up here. But this case, we have a negative 4 gradient, so we move 1 in x, we're going to move negative 4 in y. So that means down here at 1 minus 1. If I was to join those two points together, and then continue this line onwards, something like so, it's a little inaccurate, but it will work for our purposes. This is the line y is equal to minus 4x plus 3. Let's test that out again. These lines aren't the most accurate ever, but let's use a value of 2 in x. So minus 4 times 2 will be minus 8, plus 3 should be minus 5. So if we run down here and across... Yeah, not perfectly accurate, but we are near minus 5, so that is indeed working. So just one last question that I'd like for you guys to attempt. And this is question 5. And question 5 is 2y is equal to 4x plus 6. So go ahead, pause the video, give this a go, and when we come back I'm going to work through the answer. Alright, welcome back everyone. Now I've got a bit of a confession. This is a trick question because we have 2y here, so we don't currently have it in the format of y equals mx plus c. How do we get it in that format? We need to get y here on its own. We're taking 2 times y, and we've seen in the rearranging equations video that if we wanted to get y on its own, we're going to need to divide by 2. So if I was to divide 2y by 2, I must do the same to the other side of the equation. 4x plus 6 over 2, which becomes y is equal to, I can split this division apart, this is sort of a rule of fractions, I'm not going to get into specifics, but you can look this up in maths textbooks, this is perfectly valid, and now I can say that well, y is equal to 4 over 2 is 2x, plus 6 over 2 is 3, so y is e actually equal to 2x plus 3, so let me make a note of that up here. y is equal to 2x plus 3. Why is this a trick question? Because back in question 1, I believe, I've already asked you to plot that line. So you didn't need to draw it again. We already have it. The line 2y equals 4x plus 6 is the exact same line as the line y equals 2x plus 3. So that is going to conclude all of our questions. So to recap everything we've seen in this video, any straight line can be represented in 2D Cartesian space using the equation y equals mx plus c. We know that a point xy will lie on the line. We know that m is the gradient of the line at defines indirectly the angle from the x-axis. It defines how steep the line is. It's the relationship between how far we move in x and how far we move in y. We know that c is the intercept. It's where the line cuts the y-axis, and it defines the position of the line. And that's really all there is to it. It's a simple equation, y equals mx plus c. It can define any straight line in 2D Cartesian space, and there are just two properties that you can manipulate, the gradient and the intercept. So in the next video, we're going to take everything we've learned in this video, and I'm going to show you how, if we know two points in 2D Cartesian space, how using the coordinates of those points, we can determine the equation of the line that runs through those two points. So thanks a lot for listening, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.